In this part of the lecture, we will introduce propensity scores, and then we'll use those to introduce the method of inverse probability weighting for estimating causal effects. The propensity score is just the probability of taking treatment t equals 1, given the relevant covariates w that we'd be adjusting for. So this quantity describes your propensity for taking treatment, how likely you are to take treatment given w. And we'll use E of W to denote the propensity score. So here's the kind of amazing thing about propensity scores. Given positivity, if you have unconfoundedness, given W, so if W is a sufficient adjustment set, then you have unconfoundedness given the propensity score, E of W. This is kind of amazing because even if W is super high dimensional, the propensity score is only one dimensional. Right, it's only a scalar. It's just the probability that treatment equals 1, given W. And this really cool result is known as the propensity score theorem. Mathematically, we can write it as follows. To see why this is true, I'll give you a graphical proof. So consider that this is the graph, that W is a confounder of the effect of T on Y, and importantly here, W is a sufficient adjustment set. This edge from W to T is the causal mechanism that we can write as just this conditional distribution, P of T given W. Now, if T is binary, this isn't key to the argument, but if T is binary, we can completely describe this conditional distribution of T using just the probability of T equals 1 given W, right? So to get the rest of the distribution, which is the probability that T equals 0 given W, just subtract this from 1. So this quantity completely describes that distribution. And this is just the propensity score. Okay, so let's just put that propensity score there in the graph. So now we have a node in the graph for the propensity score. And what this theorem is saying is that if W blocks all backdoor paths from t to y, then that implies that e of w, the propensity score, blocks all backdoor paths from t to y, which should hopefully be graphically clear now. If you want to see a non-graphical proof using just equations, then go ahead and check out Appendix A.2 of the course book. So the propensity score has pretty big implications for the positivity unconfoundedness trade-off that we saw back in week two. So for this trade-off, recall that the overlap decreases with the dimensionality of the adjustment set. Another way of saying that is that we get more likely to have positivity violations or existing positivity violations get worse. So here's a super high dimensional W. Because W is so high dimensional, it seems likely that we'll have positivity violation. But the propensity score theorem tells us that we don't need to condition on W. We can just condition on the propensity score, which is a scalar. So the propensity score is a bit magical in that it takes this high dimensional W and reduces it to just a single dimension. Now, if we condition on just this scalar, we're much less likely to have overlap violations because it's only one dimensional. Great, so problem solved, right? Unfortunately, not really, because we don't have access to the propensity score. The best we can do is model the propensity score using some model, say, in scikit-learn. For example, logistic regression is really popular. And when we model the propensity score, we're just shifting the high-dimensionality problem to the modeling of the propensity score. So, unfortunately, we haven't really solved this positivity unconfoundedness trade-off. All right, so I now have three questions for you about what we just saw on propensity scores. The first is, what is the intuition behind why we can condition on the propensity score E of W instead of W? The second question is, what is attractive about conditioning on E of W as opposed to W? And the third question is, why does this not solve our positivity issues when W is high dimensional? Now that we've defined propensity scores, we'll be moving on to inverse probability weighting, and for that, we'll first introduce pseudo-populations. The general idea here is that even though 
association is not causation in the general population because of confounding, will create pseudopopulations where association is causation. So consider a regular population where W is a confounder of the effect of T on Y. One way to see why association is not causation is that we have a backdoor path from T to W to Y because we have this edge W to T. And we have this edge W to T because the conditional distribution of T given W is not just equal to P of T, right? So T actually depends on W. We need to keep W behind the conditioning bar here. Well, what if we could reweight this population so that we end up with that distribution equal to just this marginal, just P of T, or even just due to some constant? Importantly, it just doesn't have W behind the conditioning bar here. Then in this pseudo population, really the graph looks like this, right? So T no longer depends on W. And we can get to a pseudo population by this via reweighting. More specifically, we reweight by the reciprocal of the propensity score, by the inverse probability of treatment. And the intuition for this reweighting is that we take this conditional distribution, P of T given W, and we just reweight it. So we reweight all of the examples by the inverse probability of treatment, and then those two cancel and we end up getting one. Importantly, the thing that we end up getting does not depend on W. So by multiplying by the reciprocal of the propensity score, we've basically deleted this edge from W to T. Okay, now we can introduce inverse probability weighting. We start with some observational distribution that's, say, generated by this causal graph. Importantly, we need that W is a sufficient adjustment set. So from this observational distribution, we get observational values of the outcome, Y. And then we're going to reweight these by the reciprocal of the propensity score, the inverse probability. And as we gave some intuition for in the previous slide, you can think of this reweighting as deleting this edge from W to T. Then all that's left is to specify that the causal estimate that we're interested in here is the expected potential outcome YT. And then we're going to limit the specific data samples that we look at to this, the ones that have treatment t equals little t. So the little t's match here. And then we take an expectation of this whole thing. So on the left-hand side here, we have a causal estimate, and then we have a corresponding statistical estimate on the right-hand side that we get from inverse probability weighting. And you can see the proof for this in Appendix A3 of the course book. It turns out that this statistical estimate is equivalent to the estimate that we're used to seeing, the one in COM estimation. But this formulation of the statistical estimate suggests a different kind of estimation, inverse probability weighting. So we'll now write down the ATE, so just taking the above equation and plugging in t equals 1 and t equals 0. And we're now going to use propensity score notation. So here we have 1 minus the propensity score, because remember, propensity score is probability of t equals 1, not, p, not probability of p equals 0. Then we can turn this statistical estimate into an estimator using what you might expect. We model the propensity score using e hat here. And then we approximate this expectation where we're only pulling out the treatment equals 1 data using this sum and dividing by 1 over the number of treatment samples. Similarly, we do the same for this expectation when we're selecting out the t equals 0 samples. Okay, so that's our basic IPW estimator. This then leads me to two questions. The first is, what happens if the estimated propensity score for some unit is either 1 or 0? Similarly, what happens if the estimated propensity score isn't quite 1 or 0, but it's near 1 or 0?
So we just saw IPW estimation of the average treatment effect, the ATE, but what about IPW estimation of the conditional average treatment effect? Kate estimation is not quite as natural with IPW as with COM, so it's beyond the scope of the course. A very simple extension would be to just restrict, so for the CATE for this X, would be to just restrict this sum to data points where we have that specific X and then divide by the number of data points that have that specific X. And that's going to impact what terms are in this sum here. But this might not work super well, especially if not very many data points have that specific value of x. To read more about IPW Kate estimation, you can check out this paper and some of the references in it. Here are two questions for the propensity scores and IPW section. The first is, what is the graphical intuition for how inverse probability weighting deals with confounding? And the second question is, what do we model in IPW? and compare that to what do we model in COM slash GCOM estimation.